Good afternoon or even evening everyone and welcome to Charleston and I'm delighted to be introducing our speaker this afternoon, this evening, Sir Max Hastings. Before saying a few brief words about him, I'd just like to thank our sponsor. Um, our sponsor for this evening's event is EFG Private Bank and we're very grateful for the support they've given not just for this event but for a number of events in the festival and also um, because they continue to support the Sunday Times EFG Short Story Prize so we're very grateful to them. Um, a few words about Max Hastings. He's a journalist, author, editor and historian. He is the son of the noted journalist and war correspondent Macdonald Hastings and the author and journalist Anne Scott James. And he's reported on at least 11 wars and assorted conflicts all over the world. He was famously the first journalist to enter the liberated Port Stanley during the Falklands and his work has appeared in every British newspaper, every British national newspaper, and he now writes regularly for the Daily Mail and the Financial Times, which he's contributing editor. He's published over 23 books, has presented many television documentaries, and has a legendary capacity for work. I think he rises at five in the morning and writes as much as 5,000 words a day, 2,000 before breakfast, I mean, it's incredible. Well, I think... Uh, <laughs> Writer's block is apparently something that's entirely <coughs> unknown to him, and his friend and fellow historian Anthony Beaver says that he approaches his computer keyboard with the alain of a concert pianist at the piano. <laughs> um, the majority of his books are on military themes, and he said that he thought his wife Penny would have preferred to have lived through the Second World War than to read any more books about it by him. Um, his most recent book, All Hell Let Loose, The World at War, 1939-45, was published to huge acclaim in September, Hailed as the definitive single volume account of the war, The Guardian said it conveys the pity of war and its immediate aftermath with scholarship and proper sympathy. Please join me in welcoming Max Hastings. Well, good evening, everybody, and thanks so much for those very kind words, uh, most of which are quite untrue. But uh, uh, if I do get up at five o'clock in the morning, it's only in the summer. Um, I've devoted much of my career to the study of war and the Second World War in particular. Uh, and the most profound influence of doing that on me, as on all those who consider modern history, is to inspire humility and gratitude for what our parents or grandparents endured and we have been mercifully spared. I wrote All Hell Let Loose with two ideas in mind. First, to try to offer some of my own thoughts about great issues which I haven't discussed in earlier books and about which I hope I might have something new to bring to the party, to complete my personal cycle about the Second World War, if you like. To give a few examples, it seems to me a remarkable paradox that while the German army fought most of its battles brilliantly well, much better than the Allies, its efforts were entirely set at naught by the stunning incompetence with which Germany's leadership conducted the war, fortunately for us. Meanwhile, whatever the limitations of the British Army, the Royal Navy's and RAF's achievements were remarkable. Britain's war machine was superbly organized, especially in mobilizing its best civilian brains, an achievement exemplified by the decryptors of Bletchley Park in a fashion the Axis never remotely matched. For years, the turning point of the war was seen as coming at the end of 1942 with German defeat at Stalingrad. Yet it seems a critical historical reality that as early as December 1941, before Pearl Harbor, senior functionaries of the Third Reich realized and even dared to tell Hitler that failure to defeat Russia before winter meant that military victory in the conflict had become unattainable. Counterfactuals might have been, must be treated with caution. But some can be fascinating. For instance, I suggest that Hitler might have done far more towards persuading the British to surrender in 1940 by not sending the Luftwaffe to bomb them than by doing so. Before the war, many people feared an annihilatory air attack which would destroy British society. The unfulfilled threat of such an assault might have done much more to intimidate the public than the reality, which turned out to be nowhere near as bad as everybody had feared. If the British had simply been left to stew while Hitler seized Malta and drove them out of the Middle East, as he almost certainly could have done, Churchill might have found it very hard to retain the premiership. The old Tory appeasers might have gained traction for a peace negotiation with Germany. <laughs> 
My other, and I believe more important purpose in this book, is to address the question so often asked by generations uh, which have been fortunate enough not to be there, daddy or granddad, what was the war like? Well, the answer, of course, is that it was vastly different in kind for people in different circumstances. British tank crews and Chinese comfort women, American paratroopers and Leningrad housewives, German panzer officers and Polish Jews. I've tried to create not so much a history as a global portrait from the bottom up, a story of little people rather than warlords. You'll find no photographs in my text of generals or dictators, only of men, women, and children of embattled societies. People from scores of nations struggled to find words to describe what happened to them in the war, transcending anything they'd known in their past lives. Many resorted to a cliché, all hell broke loose. Now, because the phrase is common in eyewitness descriptions of battles, air raids, massacres, ship sinkings, later generations attempted to shrug at its banality. Yet I've chosen it as my title because the words capture so vividly what the struggle meant to hundreds of millions of people plucked from their ordered existences to face ordeals that in many cases lasted for years. Each day of the conflict, an average of 27,000 human beings perished around the world by violence, starvation, or war-induced disease. We sometimes read memoirs written by, or books written about, heroes who make the whole experience sound a romp, a great romantic adventure. For instance, Lieutenant Robert Hitchens of the Royal Navy wrote in his diary in July 1940, I suppose our position is about as dangerous as is possible in view of the threatened invasion. But I couldn't help being full of joy. Being on the bridge of one of His Majesty's ships, being talked to by the captain as an equal, knowing that she was to be in my sole care for the next few hours. Who would not rather die like that than live as so many poor people have to in crowded cities at some sweating indoor job? Hitchens was killed in action in 1942 but he was a happy warrior. It's easy to understand why such a dashing young naval officer or Winston Churchill, General George Patton, pilots who flew Spitfires and Mustangs, some German panzer officers, had the time of their lives in World War II. For a much larger number of people, however, for hundreds of millions around the world who never had the opportunity or inclination to be heroes, the conflict required acceptance of miseries, hardships, and sacrifices, matched by a sense of personal impotence, which made the experience wretched. Consider, for instance, a pathetic letter home written by William Crawford, a 17-year-old boy second class serving aboard the battlecruiser Hood. Dearest Mum, I know it's wrong to say, but I sure am fed up. I feel kind of sick. I cannot eat and my heart's in my mouth. We've struck bad weather today. Talk about waves as big as houses. They're crashing over our bows. I wonder if it would do any good, Mum, if you wrote to the Admiralty and asked them if there was no chance of me getting a shore job at Recythe. <laughs> you know, tell them you've got two sons away and that. Be sure to tell them my age. If only I could get off this ship, it would not be so bad. Crawford, however, was still aboard Hood when she was sunk with almost all hands in May 1941. He was just one of 60 million people of all ages and both sexes for whom the conflict became a personal tragedy. When I first explored the war in Bomber Command, published in 1979, I would never have guessed that the period would retain its grip on popular imagination around the world into this 21st century. There seem three reasons. This was the greatest event in human experience. Most people perceive it as that rare thing, a conflict in which good was pitted against indisputable evil. And finally, there seems inexhaustible scope for finding new things to say about it. Even after countless books, films, and TV documentaries, it's amazing how easy it is to surprise people with facts known to historians, but little recognized by a wider public. 
I mentioned to a former head of the British Army a year or two ago that I'd written a new study of the war, and he responded skeptically. He said, what on earth can you tell us that we don't know already? I asked him to guess what proportion of Germany's military dead were killed by the Russians. He suggested 60%. I told him the true figure is nearer 95%. Germany's invasion of Russia was the defining event of World War II. After Hitler's triumphs in 1940 over Britain and France, it never occurred to him that it might be more difficult to overcome a brutalized society inured to suffering than democracies in which moderation and respect for human life were deemed virtues. I next asked my military friend what percentage of total Allied casualties he supposed to have been British or American, and he said maybe 20% each. The real figure was just 2% British, 2% American. The Russians suffered 65%, the Chinese 23%, the Yugoslavs 3%. At least 15 million Chinese died in the war. Now, mere numbers are, of course, only part of the story, but they help to emphasize how far people still have to travel to achieve a sense of perspective about what happened to mankind between 1939 and 45. Some modern nations are stunningly ignorant or willfully misinformed. A few years ago, a Japanese writer named Kazutoshi Hando, who himself survived the Tokyo fire storm, lectured to a women's college. He told me, I asked 50 students to list countries which have not fought Japan in modern times. 11 included America. Because the Soviet Union ended up in the Allied camp, not only most modern Russians, but also many Westerners, are unaware that between 1939 and June 1941, Stalin was seen around the world as Hitler's partner in tyranny and aggression, the rapist of Finland, Eastern Poland, Eastern Romania. At least 350,000 Poles died as victims of Russian rather than Nazi oppression and imprisonment. In my view, only the single enormity of the Holocaust justifies judging Hitler a more dreadful and murderous tyrant than Stalin. Yet Russia was supposedly joined with Britain and America in a crusade for freedom. Confusing, isn't it? Many Westerners' view of the war remains dominated by nationalistic perspectives, cherished myths and legends. Everybody knows about the gallant fighters of the French resistance, supported by British agents of SOE, Rather fewer people appreciate how fiercely French troops fought against the British in Syria in 1941, as they did also in Madagascar and briefly in North Africa the following year. A French soldier scrawled a graffiti on the wall of a fort in Syria before his unit abandoned it in the face of advancing British troops. Wait, dirty English bastards, until the Germans come. We run away now but so will you soon. Few people have heard of a French fighter pilot named Pierre Leglouin. He became an ace by shooting down seven RAF aircraft over Syria in 1941. The writer Roald Dahl, who flew a hurricane in that campaign, wrote later, I for one have never forgiven the Vichy French for the unnecessary slaughter they caused. Between June 1940 and May 1945, more Frenchmen carried arms for Vichy or the German forces than ever fought for the resistance or Allied armies. The great majority of French troops evacuated from Dunkirk to Britain chose to be repatriated to their own country under German occupation rather than serve with the free French of General de Gaulle, as too did most of those captured in Syria in 1941. It's easy to forget that in many nations around the world, many people rooted for the Axis, often because they hated the British Empire. Winston Churchill stretched a delicate point by telling the House of Commons on the 8th of December 1941, 
we have at least four-fifths of the population of the globe on our side. It would have been more accurate to say that the Allies had four-fifths of the world's inhabitants under their control or recoiling from Axis occupation. <laughs> Propaganda promoted an assumption of common purpose among so-called free nations, of which it was necessary to grant honorary membership to Stalin's tyranny in defeating the totalitarian powers. Yet in almost every country, there were nuances of attitude and in some places stark divisions. The mercenaries of Britain's Indian Army remained generally loyal, and some Indian civilians cherished a deep affection for Britain. I'm always moved by the story of one named P.G. Martin Dasa, who was teacher of the English school in Malacca settlement. He wrote, after torture and before execution by the occupying Japanese for listening on his radio to the BBC, I have always cherished British sportsmanship, justice, and the civil service as the finest things in an imperfect world. I die gladly for freedom. My enemies fail to conquer my soul. I forgive them for what they did to my frail body. To my dear boys, tell them that their teacher died with a smile on his lips. But we should acknowledge that many of India's 400 million people saw scant advantage in Allied victory if they remained subject to British rule. For most of the war, the imperial power was obliged to use more troops to maintain its internal control of India in the face of militant nationalists than were deployed against the Japanese. Nehru, later the first and greatest prime minister of an independent India, wrote from his British prison cell on the day after Pearl Harbor, if I were asked with whom my sympathies lay in this war, I would unhesitatingly say with Russia, China, America, and England. But for the Congress president, there remained an insuperable obstacle to giving the Allies his active support. Churchill refused to grant India independence, and thus Nehru critically qualified the above. He wrote, there is no question of my giving help to Britain how can I fight for a thing, freedom, which is denied to me? British policy in India appears to be to terrify the people so that in anxiety we may seek British protection. Meanwhile, in Egypt, Britain exploited to the limits and beyond its treaty rights with a supposedly sovereign state. The country was governed as if it was a colony. Most Egyptians strongly supported the Axis, believing that its victory would free them from imperial subjection. During riots in 1942, crowds thronged Cairo streets shouting enthusiastically, Rommel, Rommel. Anwar Sadat, an army officer who later became Egypt's president, spent much of the war in a British jail for aiding German agents. He wrote later, our enemy was primarily, if not solely, Great Britain. Now, None of this is intended to suggest that I doubt the virtue of the Allied cause. Rather, what I'm trying to show is that at the time, Churchill and Roosevelt did not have all the best tunes. It does us no harm in justly congratulating our parents and grandparents on what they did to be reminded of some blemishes on the Allied discussion, um, foremost among them the 1943 Bengal famine. At least one million people perhaps as many as three millions, perished under British rule. Thousands died on the streets of Calcutta, while in the city's clubs, white saibs enjoyed unlimited eggs and bacon. The famines originated in Japanese seizure of neighboring Burma, from which much of Bengal's rice supply traditionally came, and it was worsened by crop failure and a cyclone. To the dismay of Wavell, India's viceroy, Churchill refused to divert shipping to transport food to relieve the needy. The Prime Minister cited the urgent strategic demands of the war, which were real enough. But Wavell wrote bitterly later when hundreds of bombers were used to feed Holland, a very different attitude exists towards feeding a starving population when the starvation is in Europe. More than any other aspect of the war, food 
or lack of it, emphasize the relativity of suffering. Globally, far more people suffered serious hunger, indeed died of starvation, than in any previous conflict in history because an unprecedented range of countries became battlefields with consequent loss of agricultural production. Even those countries that escaped famine found their diet severely restricted. Britain's rationing system ensured that nobody starved and the poor were better nourished than in peacetime, but few found anything to enjoy about their fare. A land girl named Joan Ibbotson wrote, food was our obsession. We had dried egg once a week for breakfast, but the good lady in charge liked to cook it overnight, so it resembled and tasted like sawdust on toast. We had fish paste on toast too some mornings. One Christmas we were allowed to buy a chicken. My bird was so old and tough that we could hardly chew through it. Each week a British adult was entitled to four ounces of lard or butter, eight ounces of sugar, four of bacon, two eggs, six ounces of meat, two of tea, and unlimited vegetables or homegrown fruit off ration if available. Most households improvised to supplement authorised issues. Derek Lambert, who was then a small boy living in the suburbs of London, recorded a domestic scene. One morning, a jar was put on the breakfast table with supreme nonchalance. My father, an undemonstrative man, spread the nectar on his bread and bit into it. He frowned and said, what was that? My mother said, carrot marmalade. With unusual deliberation, he picked up the jar, took it into the garden, and poured it onto the compost heap. <laughs> but any Russian or Asian peasant or Axis captive would have thought carrot marmalade a luxury. Kenneth Stevens was a prisoner in Singapore's Shangi jail. He wrote, in this place, One's mind returns continually and dwells longingly on food. I think of duck and cherry casseroles, scrambled eggs, fish scallops, chicken standy, kedgeree, trifle, summer pudding, fruit full, bread and butter pudding. All those lovely things were made just perfectly right in my own home. Stevens died of disease and starvation in August 1943 without ever again tasting such delicacies. French girl children shrank by an average of 11 centimetres, boys by 7 centimetres, between 1935 and 44. Tuberculosis, stimulated by malnutrition, increased dramatically in occupied Europe, and by 1943, four-fifths of Belgian children were displaying symptoms of rickets. In most countries, city dwellers suffered more from hunger than country folk because they had fewer opportunities to supplement their diet by growing their own produce. The poor lacked cash to use the black market, which in all countries continued to feed those who could pay. In the matter of diet, Canada, Australia and New Zealand escaped likely, and Americans scarcely suffered at all. Rationing was introduced to Roosevelt's people only in 1943, and then on a generous scale. Gourmet magazine gushed tastelessly. Imports of European delicacies may dwindle, but America has battalions of good food to rush to appetite's defense. Meat was almost the only commodity in short supply. The Americans complained bitterly about that. A housewife named Catherine Renee Young wrote to her husband in May 1943, I'm sick of the same thing. We hardly ever see good steak anymore, and steak is the main meat that gives us strength. My dad just came back from the store, and all he could get was blood pudding, and how I hate that. But whatever the shortcomings of wartime quality, American domestic meat consumption fell very little, even when huge quantities were exported to Britain and Russia. Every nation with power to do so put its own people first, heedless of the consequences for others at their mercy. Not surprisingly, the Axis behaved most brutally and with the direst consequences. Nazi policy in the East was explicitly directed 
towards starving subject races in order to feed Germans. People in occupied regions displayed extraordinary ingenuity in hiding crops from the occupiers and clung tenaciously to life in defiance of the predictions of Nazi nutritionists who'd anticipated 30 to 40 million fatalities. But in pursuit of the Wehrmacht policy of living off the land, German soldiers in the East consumed an estimated 7 million tons of Russian grain, 17 million cattle, 20 million pigs, 27 million sheep and goats, over 100 million domestic fowls, and millions of their lawful owners starved to death in consequence. The Japanese, throughout their empire, adopted draconian policies to provide food for their own people, which caused mass starvation in Southeast Asia, with at least one million fatal victims in Vietnam alone. China also suffered appallingly, its peasants despoiled by both the Japanese and the Nationalist Army. In Henan province in 1942, when unseasonable frost and hail were followed by a plague of locusts, millions had to leave their land and many perished. Peasants ate elm bark and dried leaves. Though the Allies weren't responsible for anything like the human toll inflicted by the Axis, their policies displayed also a harsh nationalistic selfishness. The United States insisted that both its own people at home and armed forces abroad should receive fantastically generous allocations of food, even when shipping space was at a premium. Meanwhile, in Leningrad, in the course of almost three years under siege, 800,000 people perished, and some survived only by eating each other. In the first 10 days of January 1942, Stalin's secret police, the NKVD, reported 42 cases of cannibalism. Corpses were found with thighs and breasts hacked off. Worse, the weak became vulnerable to murder, not for their meaningless property, but for their flesh. On the 4th of February, a man visiting a militia office reported seeing 12 women who'd been arrested for cannibalism, which they did not deny. He wrote, one woman, utterly worn out and desperate, said that when her husband fainted through exhaustion and lack of food, she hacked off part of his leg to feed herself and her children. The prisoners sobbed knowing that they faced execution. That February, by far the worst month of the siege, 20,000 people were reported to be dying every day. Many of those with energy to read turned to War and Peace, the only book that seemed capable of explaining their agony. In the West, British and American infantrymen were appalled by their experiences in the 11 months of the 1944-45 Northwest Europe campaign. But Russians and Germans fought each other continuously for almost four years in far worse conditions and with vastly heavier casualties. The Eastern Front overwhelmingly dominated the struggle against Hitler. Between 1941 and 44, British and American sailors and airmen engaged the Axis at sea and in the sky, but relatively small numbers of Western Allied ground troops took part in the little campaigns in North Africa, Italy, Asia, and the Pacific. In July 1943, when almost four million Axis and Soviet troops were locked in bloody combat at Kursk on a rail, where half a million Russians died, just eight Anglo-American divisions were fighting the Nazis in Sicily, um, the scene of the principal Western effort against Hitler, and they suffered just 6,000 dead. was Russia alone in the scale of sufferings far worse than anything Westerners experienced. I've mentioned above China's ordeal amid Japanese invasion and occupation. Yugoslavia, where civil war was overlaid on Axis occupation, lost more than a million dead. Many people, soldiers and civilians alike, witness spectacles comparable with Renaissance painters' conception of the inferno to which the damned were consigned human beings torn to fragments of flesh and bone, cities blasted into rubble, 
ordered communities sundered into dispersed human particles. Almost everything civilized people take for granted in times of peace, above all the expectation of being protected from violence, was swept aside. I've tried to illuminate the conflict's significance for a host of ordinary people, both active and passive participants, but the distinction is often blurred. Was a Hamburg woman who ardently supported Hitler but died in the July 1943 firestorm generated by Allied bombing an accomplice to Nazi war guilt or the innocent victim of an atrocity? So widespread is a modern Western perception that the war was fought about Jews that it deserves to be emphasized that this was not the case. Though Hitler and his followers chose to blame the Jews for the troubles of Europe and grievances of the Third Reich, Germany's struggle with the Allies was about power on hemispheric dominance. The plight of the Jewish people under Nazi occupation loomed relatively small in the wartime perceptions of Churchill and Roosevelt, and less surprisingly in those of Stalin. About one-seventh of all fatal victims of Nazism and almost a tenth of all wartime dead ultimately proved to have been Jews. But at the time, their persecution was viewed by the Nazis, by the Allies, merely as one fragment of the collateral damage of Hitler, as indeed Russians still see the Holocaust today. It seems to me important to assess it not in isolation, as is usually done, but against the background of Hitler's entire governance of his empire, which included, for instance, starving to death more than three million Russian prisoners in German hands. One of the most moving and enlightened advocates of pursuing such context was a young Jewish girl named Ruth Meyer. As a 22-year-old refugee in Oslo, barely a month before her own deportation and murder in Auschwitz, she wrote in her diary, if you shut yourself away and look at this persecution and torture of Jews only from the viewpoint of a Jew, then you'll develop some sort of complex which is bound to lead to a slow but certain psychological collapse. The only solution is to see the Jewish question from a broader perspective, within the framework of the oppressed Czechs and Norwegians, the oppressed workers, will only be rich when we understand that it's not just we who are a race of martyrs, that beside us there are countless other sufferings who will suffer like us until the end of time if we don't, if we don't fight for a better... She broke off to express exasperation about the persistence of her own instinct to see the Jewish tragedy as unique but her mental confusion does not diminish the nobility and unselfishness of this very young woman's words from the threshold of the grave. One of the most important truths about the war, as indeed about all human affairs, is that people can interpret what happens to them only in the context of their own circumstances. The fact that objectively and statistically the sufferings of some individuals were less terrible than those of others somewhere else in the world was absolutely meaningless to those concerned. It would have seemed monstrous to a British or American soldier facing a mortar barrage with his comrades dying around him to be told that Russian casualties were many times larger. It would have been insulting to invite a hungry Frenchman or even an English housewife weary of the monotony of rations simply to thank their stars that they weren't starving to death in millions like the Russians or West Bengalis who were selling their daughters. The fact that the plight of other people was worse than one's own did little to promote personal stoicism. Some aspects of wartime experience were almost universal, fear and grief. The conscription of young men and women obliged to endure new existences utterly remote from those of their choice, often under arms and at worst as slaves. A boom in prostitution was a tragic global phenomenon. The conflict provoked many mass migrations. Some of these were orderly. Half the population of Britain moved home in the course of the war, and many Americans took new jobs in unfamiliar places. Elsewhere, however, millions were wrenched from their communities, 
in dreadful circumstances and faced ordeals which often killed them. An anonymous Berlin woman wrote in April 1945 in one of the great diaries of the war, these are strange times, history experienced firsthand, the stuff of tales yet untold and songs unsung. But seen close up, history is much more troublesome, nothing but burdens and fears. Tomorrow I'll go and look for nettles and get some coal. News of the violent and premature deaths of distant loved ones was a pervasive feature of wartime experience. Often very little was known about their fate as J.R. Ackerley noted in a 1942 poem published in The Spectator. We never knew what became of him that was so curious. He embarked, it was in December, and never returned. No chance to say goodbye, and Christmas confronting us. A few letters arrived long after and came to an end. The weeks dragged into months, and then it was December again. We troubled the officials, of course, and they cabled about. They were patient but busy, importunities without number. Some told us one thing, some another. They never found out. There's a lot go like that, without explanation. And death is death after all. Small comfort to know how and when. But I keep thinking, now that we've dropped the investigation, it was more like the death of an insect than of a man. The nature of battlefield experience varied from nation to nation, service to service. Within armies, riflemen experienced far higher levels of risk and hardship than millions of support troops. The United States Armed Forces suffered an overall death rate of just five per thousand men enlisted. The vast majority of those who served suffered perils no greater than those of ordinary civilian life. While 17,000 American combat casualties lost limbs, during the war years, 100,000 workers at home became amputees because of industrial accidents. Nobody except national leaders and commanders knew much about anything uh, beyond their immediate line of sight. Civilians existed in a fog of propaganda and uncertainty scarcely less dense in Britain and the United States than in Germany or Russia. Frontline combatants assessed the success or failure of their own side, chiefly through counting casualties and noticing whether they were moving forwards or backwards. But these were sometimes inadequate indicators. For instance, Private Eric Diller's battalion was cut off from the main American army for 17 days during the Leyte campaign in the Philippines. But he realized the seriousness of his unit's predicament only when this was explained to him by his company commander after the war was over. Even those with privileged access to secrets were confined to their own fragments of knowledge in a vast jigsaw puzzle. My old friend Roy Jenkins, uh, the latest statesman, decrypted German signals at Bletchley Park. He and his colleagues knew the importance and urgency of the work they were doing, but contrary to the impression given in sensational films about Bletchley, they were told nothing about the significance or impact of their contributions. And such constraints were greater, unsurprisingly, on the other side of the hill. In January 1942, Hitler decided that too many Germans knew too much. He decreed that even officials of the Abwehr, the intelligence service, should receive only such information as was necessary for their own work. They were forbidden even to monitor enemy broadcasts, which was quite a handicap for an intelligence service. <laughs> Under fire, the hell of bombardment, most people focused upon immediacies and loyalties towards each other. Their hopes and fears became elemental as described by Lieutenant Norman Craig in the desert. Life was so free of all its complexities. What a clarity and simplicity it really had. To stay alive, to lead once more a normal existence, to know again warmth, comfort, safety. What else could one conceivably demand? If I survived, I would never chide circumstance again, never question fate, never feel bored, unhappy, dissatisfied. To be allowed to continue to live, nothing else mattered. The chances of achieving this simple purpose varied immensely from country to country. 
About 8% of all Germans died compared with 14% of Soviet citizens, 2% of Chinese, 3.4% of Dutch people, almost 7% of Yugoslavs, 4% of Greeks, 1.35% of French people, 3.78% of Japanese, 0.94% of British people, 0.32% of Americans. One Russian soldier in four died against one in 20 British Commonwealth combatants, one in 34 American servicemen. When the Western Allies celebrated victory in Europe in May 1945, tens of millions of people under Stalin's new tyranny continued to suffer appallingly. For instance, for two years after V Day, the NKVD waged a bloody counterinsurgency campaign in Poland and Ukraine to impose Stalin's will upon peoples consumed with bitterness about exchanging Nazi tyranny for that of the Soviets. Exiled Poles in London were dismayed to be denied a place in London's victory parade because the new British Labour government declined to upset the Russians. One of their commanders, General Vladislaw Anders, wrote, I felt as if I were peeping at a ballroom from behind the curtain of an entrance door through which I might not pass. Shortly before Labour took office in July, Anders encountered the American ambassador and British Foreign Secretary, Anthony Eden, at a banquet. They greet me politely, but without enthusiasm, since our only crime is that we exist and thereby embarrass Allied policy. I do not consider myself obliged to hide or feel ashamed. His bitterness was justified. He and almost 150,000 of his compatriots had fought gallantly with the Allied forces, suffering heavy casualties in Italy and Northwest Europe. A Polish pilot named Lvov wrote, We, the Poles in uniform, integrated into the British armed forces, became an ugly sore on the English conscience. In 1945, he and his comrades suddenly found themselves pariahs for the crime of rejecting a Stalinist puppet regime in their own country for whose freedom Britain and France had gone to war in September 1939. The Poles ended the conflict as they started it, human sacrifices to realities of power. And as Lvov and many of their compatriots chose exile in the West rather than return home to Soviet subjection and probable execution. The Americans and British had delivered half Europe from one totalitarian tyranny, but they lacked the political will and military means to save 90 million people in the East from falling victim to a new Soviet bondage that lasted almost half a century. The price of having joined with Hitler to destroy, uh, to have joined with Stalin to destroy Hitler was high indeed. Within Western culture today, the conflict continues to exercise a fascination for generations unborn when it took place. One obvious explanation is that within the vast compass of the struggle, some individuals scaled summits of courage and nobility, while others plumbed depths of evil in a fashion that compels the awe of posterity. Among citizens of modern democracies, to whom serious hardship and collective peril are unknown, the tribulations which hundreds of millions endured between 1939 and 45 are almost beyond comprehension. Almost all those who participated, nations and individuals alike, made moral compromises. It's impossible to dignify the struggle as an unalloyed contest between good and evil, nor rationally to celebrate an experience which imposed such misery upon so many. Allied victory did not bring universal peace, prosperity, justice or freedom. It brought merely a portion of those things to some fraction of those who took part. All that seems certain is that Allied victory saved the world from a much, much worse fate that would have followed the triumph of Germany and Japan. With this knowledge, seekers after virtue and truth 
must be content. Thank you very much. So we've now got two roving microphones in the audience. Um, I'm sure there'll be lots of questions. Please put your hands up. First question down there, and there's another question over there. Thank you. And if you could stand up when you ask a question. After all your um, writing and research, has your perception of Churchill and his uh, role as leader changed? It changes because um, writing things is uh, writing things about anything is a growing up process, and I've been writing about the Second World War now for um, 35 years. And I'll give you a slightly complicated answer to this question. My father brought me up to believe that the Second World War had been a sort of glorious romp that I was very unlucky to have missed. <laughs> and um, he was war correspondent of Picture Post, a role that he adored. And um, my cousin, uh, he was, sorry, his cousin was in the SAS, and my great uncle was military correspondent of the BBC. They thought the Second World War had been laid on for their amusement. Um, and I grew up with this ludicrous idea. And I think the beginning of my own sort of education about the war, um, when I was writing Bomber Command in the late 1970s, and in those days there were a lot of uh, veterans still around, I remember uh, sitting in a little bungalow in Lincolnshire, um, talking to um, a, one veteran who'd been a navigator in Lancaster. And um, they'd been shot down, and his pilot was awarded a posthumous Victoria Cross for um, staying with the aircraft in order that the others could bail out after it was hit. And this navigator, sitting in about 1977 in his bungee in Lincolnshire, he said to me, you know, he said, I always remember the last night before that last trip. He said, we were all in the pub in Lincoln. And he said, we were all teasing Jimmy, the pilot, because he admitted that he was 19 years old and he'd never kissed a girl in his life. And I suddenly thought at that moment, it went straight through me, I thought, what good did it do, this young man of 19, to have a posthumous Victoria Cross? He was dead at 19 without ever having kissed a girl in his life. Now, that's a very roundabout answer to your question. The answer is one thinking is always developing. I have no hesitation in regarding, I read a whole book about Churchill a few years ago, and there's no doubt in my mind that he was, um, I called him um, um, the brightest force uh, of, of the forces of light in the Second World War. And there's no doubt to me that he was the greatest Englishman, and no doubt that his contribution was extraordinary. But as with all these things, there are degrees of light and shade. He got lots of things wrong because everybody does. And he got less wrong than most. The important thing is that his great achievement, uh, if I can simplify, in May 1940, just about everybody, including most of the British government, thought that we were absolutely bound to lose the war. And in May 1945, miraculously, we were on the winning side. And I would say that was overwhelmingly, I personally am one of those who believes if Churchill hasn't been there, that any other credible, conceivable uh, British government would have made peace. So all his mistakes, and there were plenty of them, lots of them, uh, that my admiration, I mean, he, he, one is awed. Now, I don't think I've ever enjoyed writing a book as much as I enjoyed writing the Churchill book, because he is such an extraordinary and wonderful man. Um, but yes, one's thinking does develop. He was not without flaws. He was not perfect. He did get a lot of things wrong. And one did understand why Alan Brook, uh, his chief, the great chief of staff, Alan Brook, got absolutely fed up the teeth with him. And um, I, I, I had the conversation with Mary Sobes, and I don't think Mary would mind my repeating this, but, um, but one day I was talking to Mary about um, Alan Brook, and she never liked him. She said he was a doer Ulsterman. And I said, oh, but he was wonderful working with your father, and he did quite extraordinary things. She said, but why did he have to be so beastly about Papa and his diaries? And I said, but, you know, it was hell working with your father. He may have been a genius, but it's tough working with geniuses. But uh, anyway, that's a very long-winded answer to your question. But, and we've got uh, another question over here. Yeah. You mentioned at the very start of the talk the extraordinary tactical errors made by the leaders of the Axis. Um, could there conceivably be any connection between failures of judgment of that sort and a kind of moral flaws, or do you think we were just very lucky? Um, it was, I don't think one, when one says moral flaws, I mean, Hitler's Germany was essentially a gangster society. 
And I've often said, I don't want to read any more books about Churchill, about um, Hitler, who was, in most respects, an extraordinarily banal figure. I'm prepared to read an almost unlimited number of books which try to answer the fascinating question. Here was Germany, one of the most cultured, educated, civilized societies in the world. How could it have allowed itself to fall into the hands of these extraordinary gangsters? Um, but there, we have cause to be so grateful that um, Hitler's war machine was so staggeringly incompetent. They got almost everything wrong, except for the fact that the Wehrmacht was this extraordinary fighting force. And every time the Wehrmacht won a, bit, a victory on the battlefield, you could be sure that somebody back in Germany, probably Hitler himself, but if not, it would be Himmler or um, Goering or one of the others, would do something so ridiculous as to make whatever they did on the battlefield meaningless. And gosh, once we, should, we have cause to be grateful it was so. There's a question there. And then we've got, and then Meg, one down at the front here. Um, hello. I was in East Berlin in uh, 1976, visiting, went through Checkpoint Charlie and up the road into the main square where there was a museum, obviously uh, completely uh, run by the communist uh, regime and uh, for the benefit, no doubt, of their own people as well as visitors. I went into there and I was quite amazed to uh, find that the theme of the museum as far as the Second World War was concerned was that the, the war was in fact a, an evil plot hatched by Churchill and Hitler as capitalists against communism. This turned my understanding of the war on its head. I wondered if you have come across that. Well, perceptions, even today, the Russian understanding of the Second World War is to completely... You've got, you've got adult Russians today, virtually all of them, have grown up um, under communism, and they grew up... The, I've read quite a number of the, um, of the Russian histories of the, of the Second World War, which were published in the 60s, 70s, 80s. And even in the 70s and 80s, they were making fantastic claims. Uh, they were suggesting that... Um, that the British and the Americans did much less than they could have done to aid the Russians because uh, they wanted them destroyed. Where there was an element of truth in it, where their paranoia had some basis in fact, was that um, an, part of Churchill's genius was he recognized immediately when uh, Germany invaded uh, Russia in 1941 that whatever we thought of Russia, we had to embrace them as allies. But most, a lot of top British people, they hated the Russians. They absolutely loathed them. So John Dill, then the chief of the Imperial General Staff before um, Allenbrook, he said um, that personally he thought the Russians were so loathsome that he wanted to have as little as possible to do with them. And um, an awful lot of people felt this because they knew, after all, in 1941, Stalin had murdered far more people, his own people, than Hitler had. Um, Hitler caught up, but, um, but in the mass murdering stakes, uh, they were right up there together. But um, in terms of the picture of the war since, um, even now, I mean, again, I have a certain amount of dealings with modern Russian television and so on, and, and um, all the questions are what I would call wife-beating questions, that even today, interviewers who are making documentaries of Russian television about the Second World War um, will say, why did you leave it all to us? Um, um, don't you recognize that uh, um, really the British and Americans were absolutely pathetic and we did it all? And there's a sort of, there's a, an element of truth in it, as I've indicated in this, but nonetheless, um, I suppose another lesson one learns as one goes on writing history, an amazingly small number of countries around the world are interested, even 70 years after the event, in exploring their own histories objectively. Um, it happens in America, um, it happens in Britain, it happens in some other countries. But you take what is the only major participant in the Second World War never to have published an official history? Not Germany, um, not Italy, it's France. France has never published an official history of what took place in the war because there's not the slightest chance that the French could ever agree on a version of what happened. <laughs> um, and uh, so the only thing I would say, in uh, sort of, on, uh, sort of uh, again, related to yours, um, while it is true that the Russian view of the Second World War, we would say, was pretty odd, at the same time, a lot of other countries have pretty odd views about it too. And we've got a question on the Teddy. Yeah. Um, <coughs> yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I, at one point you raised a very interesting question where you talked about the, uh, the woman in Hamburg. Is she a, an innocent victim or a complicit accomplice of Nazism? And I wanted to see if you'd really expand on that question a little bit. 
the majority of the examples, the anecdotes you drew on, were those from the Allied experience. And whether you're able to divorce the, or the, disentangle the question of your belief in the inherent justness yep. of the Allied yep. cause despite their mistakes, and the fact that the suffering of the German people, whether on the battlefield or on their home front, is still human suffering and still worthy of being told. I think, for me, one of the most important issues that one considers whenever you're writing about this, um, and I mentioned this towards the end of my talk earlier, almost everybody who came out of the Second World War knew that they were in some degree morally compromised. Now, let me be absolutely clear. I certainly do not believe in what some people would call um, the doctrine of moral equivalence, that you do find some Germans today who will say, well, everybody did terrible things in the war, we had the Holocaust and you had the bombing of our cities and so on. I don't buy that at all. I think we must never lose sight of the fact we were better than they were, that we were on the whole the good guys. But within that framework, it seems to me that if we're grown up and we're going to bother to write and read books about all this in the 21st century, we have to be prepared to look at the nuances, the fact that... Uh, I mean, I grew up as a child believing that only the SS shot prisoners, and then you discover that almost everybody shot prisoners at some time or another. And um, I got into trouble recently because I'd mentioned something in what I'd written, uh, the case of a um, British submarine commander called Gamp Myers, um, who, uh, after sinking some German kikes in the Mediterranean loaded with, loaded with German troops, upset some of his own crew by ordering Lewis guns to be mounted on the conning tower of the submarine, uh, to um, shoot the German troops uh, struggling in the water. Now, um, uh, the, I made the point that um, Gamp Myers ended his career with the Victoria Cross and as an admiral. And uh, I said if he'd been uh, a German U-boat commander, there'd be every chance that he would have um, faced trial as a war criminal at Nuremberg. Now, um, I had some enraged letters from uh, naval officers and so on who said, how dare you compare Gamp Myers with war criminals. And I said, I'm saying something different. I'm not saying Gamp Myers should have been tried as a war criminal. What I'm, what I'm trying to explain is this degree to which everybody was morally compromised. And I stress, it's absolutely no doubt, in my mind, we were the good guys. But even the good guys did things. I mean, there's an operation called Operation Clarion that some of you will, probably most of you, have never heard of. Well, back in 1939 to 1940, the RAF went to fantastic lengths to avoid uh, dropping bombs on civilians. And, uh, in fact, would often return with their bombs from missions if they couldn't identify a military target. But by 1945, the mood had changed. And the beginning of 1945, um, the British cooked up an operation that the Americans participated in called Operation Clarion. And what Operation Clarion was designed to do was convince the German people that the game was up, that the war was lost. And there were a lot of small German communities which had never been bombed, that all the bombing had been in cities. And for 48 hours, um, every British and American aircraft attacked every community that it could hit, uh, including small rural communities in Germany, um, in order to try and convey the message to corners of Germany that might not have got it, that they lost the war. Um, all I'm, again, I'm not here to tell you that Operation Clarion was wrong. What I'm drawing, what I'm saying is there is a notable contrast between uh, that mood in September 1939, where you're desperate uh, um, never to drop a bomb unless you're sure it's on a military target, and 1945, when you're prepared to bomb literally anything that moves um, in order to get this business over. And so that's what I mean about this business of everybody being compromised, um, that... Um, you will never find in any unit war diaries um, accounts of uh, prisoners being shot and all this sort of thing. But I think I've hardly interviewed a veteran who at some point hadn't been involved in something that they felt slightly queasy about. And again, I can't overemphasize this. I'm not saying we were all like the SS. I'm just saying it's this business of nuances. And I feel, you know, people are bound to say to people like me now in the 21st century, how can you still be writing books about this after all these years? And the only case for it, it seems to me, is if we're willing to try to look at things with a degree of perspective and at some of the nuances, which not surprisingly, our parents and grandparents who were there, uh, they weren't up for this sort of thing. Okay, another question there.
Thank you. In, in your book, you refer to the fact that in 1938, 1939, Germany was on the verge of bankruptcy, and many of the Allied countries were far less than prosperous. But you ascribe some of the early losses to, a, I think you, you, the expression you use is a, a lack of moral adequacy. And I just wonder if in your mind you thought there was uh, any time in 1938, 1939, where had there been greater degrees of moral fortitude displayed by some of the Allies, as, as, uh, as so, uh, Winston Churchill displayed, whether actually some of the German aggression should either, could either have been prevented or in fact stopped? I think it's much too easy to say that, that, um, that I'm always very doubtful about the argument. If we had gone to war at the time of Munich, as uh, some people, including Churchill, argue that we should have done. First of all, uh, it, we would have been, Britain would have been a divided country. The, an enormous number of people in Britain would have still been very against the next, going to war. Um, yes, everybody says we'd have had the Czechs on our side, but I'm not really convinced that that would have been decisive. Um, we would not have had the Commonwealth with us. There's absolutely no doubt that um, the Dominions would not have followed us to war. There is a a climate, you have to get a climate going just the same way. Churchill spent the whole of 1941 desperately trying to persuade Roosevelt to bring America into the war. Well, um, I've said in my book that I think it's a jolly good thing he failed because if Roosevelt, he could probably never have forced a declaration of war through Congress anyway, but if by some miracle he'd been able to do it, America would have been profoundly divided. Um, most Americans did not want to fight Germany, period. They were willing to fight Japan, about whom they felt much more strongly. Pearl Harbor solved a fantastic number of difficulties. And even after Pearl Harbor, there were these two dreadful days when Roosevelt was very uncertain about whether Congress was going to be willing to agree to fight the Germans as well. And thank goodness, Hitler solved the problem by declaring war on the United States. But uh, my point, to come back to Britain, is there is a time. I think it's much too simple to say we should have fought them then. There is a mood. I mean, to give you a peacetime comparison, I personally believe that... Um, if Margaret Thatcher had come on the scene 10 years earlier, she couldn't have done what she did for Britain because the country hadn't yet realized that we'd hit the buffers. It had to wait till 1979 to realize that we had nowhere to go without radical reform for Thatcher to be able to do, which even then she had a lot of trouble doing uh, subsequently. And in just the same way, I do not believe that before September 1939, um, you were really going to be able to present the sort of... Um, absolutely determined united front. You know, one should always remember that most of um, Churchill's government, uh, most of the older Pisas, um, even after he assumed power, um, uh, they regard him as the cuckoo in the nest. And it wasn't until the winter of 1940, after the Battle of Britain had been fought and won, that they suddenly decided that he might not be so bad after all, that um, an awful lot of them thought the whole business of going to war had been ridiculous, and uh, they were very doubtful about it. So um, I'm just not persuaded that I think the arguments, um, a historian I often disagree with, Neil Ferguson, it's rather ironic. Neil started life as an academic and has ended up as a sort of media sensationalist, where some of us have gone a bit the other way. And, uh, and Neil wrote a book in which he said, oh, well, there need never have been a Second World War if we'd done the sensible thing and made a deal with Stalin in the 1930s. Well, quite apart from the moral aspect of this, it's just a damn stupid thing, the notion that the British and French governments could ever have got through their parliaments uh, any sort of deal with the, uh, with, with the Bolsheviks, as they were then described and considered. It's just silly. Um, I don't believe there very seldom is uh, any easy route out of the great dilemmas and difficulties of history. Thank you. We've got a question there, and then yes. we've got another one over there, and then we've got one there. Uh, you mentioned... Uh, position of France, uh, mm. uh, there's a very excellent book called French Against the French, mm. and in that book it says that the uh, French had more in their Gestapo than the Germans had. Uh, well, uh, but I wanted to raise the point about um, Mussolini. Mussolini took uh, Nice at the, uh, when the Germans occupied France, but he wasn't happy with just having Nice, he wanted more, so he took about nine other French departments, and into those French departments in the war, 30,000 Jews went down. And not many people know that, uh, of course, the French and the Germans were pursuing these Germans dramatically to try and extricate them, but they failed because Mussolini said quite adamantly that he wasn't let them go and they survived the war. So the question, what's, what's the question? Well, you haven't mentioned Mussolini at all, and, and I um, just wonder what your view well, is on Mussolini. Well, I, I, I imagine you all want to have your dinner sometime. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but, 
but uh, I have written a good deal about him in the book. In fact, I've written about two chapters about him, so I promise that it's... Uh, but it, it, you have to stop somewhere an evening like this. <laughs> so, question over here on the left. Oh, sorry, do you want to get... Yes. <laughs> yes. The more I read about uh, Montgomery, um, who in my childhood was uh, uh, a national hero, uh, the more I think he, he really didn't deserve the adulation that he got. Uh, and um, he, to my mind, to be great, you, you can't be cautious. Um, again, you know, things look different. I mean, today, most of us think that Alan Brooke was the greatest British military figure of the war. But in 1945, most of the British people had never heard of him. In the same way, opinion polls in 1945 about American generals in the United States showed that um, uh, most of them thought MacArthur, who we now, most people, including Americans, recognize as a pretty disastrous commander, was by far the most popular American general. Eisenhower was way behind him. And George Marshall, who fulfilled the same role as Alan Brooke in America, was virtually unheard of. Montgomery, I mean, your view was very much shared by Churchill, who memorably said to Violet Bonham Carter, he said, what a pity that our first commander who seems capable of winning battles should turn out to be a cad and bounder of the first water. Um, <laughs> Um, but um, I think, you know, it's often been said, I think probably rightly of Montgomery, he was a good First World War general, um, that he was, uh, he was, I think what he did brilliantly, and I don't think we should write him off. I'm somewhere in the middle about Montgomery. Um, most people, very few people are either geniuses or monsters. They're usually somewhere in between, and I'd say Montgomery was, I'd say Montgomery was a sound professional soldier, but he wasn't the military genius he thought he was. What he did brilliantly, first of all, he restored the confidence of the Desert Army, whose morale was absolutely a rock bottom. And although he jolly well should have won Alamein when he had three times as much of anything as Rommel, um, the fact remained that an awful lot of other British generals had managed to lose battles to the Germans, even when they did have a lot more of everything. So I don't think one should just write off um, Alamein and say it was bound to turn out that way. And his men passionately believed in him. Now, one reason uh, they believed in him there was a divide between Churchill and his generals because Churchill was a hero. And Churchill took it for granted everybody else wanted to be heroes. And of course they don't. What most people do, they're prepared to do their duty, but they want to come back home at the end of it. And um, Montgomery persuaded every man under his command that he was going to lead them to victory, but he was also going to try and bring them back alive. And to that citizen army, most of the men who fought under Montgomery, by God, till the day they died, they were grateful. And I think one should take heed of that. Um, this is important. I mean, I, I, there was a letter in my book on Churchill. Um, I picked out a letter that Churchill wrote to Clementine from the desert in July 1942. And he said, I'm going to visit every unit of this great army and tell them what laurels may be theirs if they do their part in the coming offensive. I thought this represented a characteristic Churchillian complete misjudgment of the mood of those men. Um, it wasn't that they were cowards or that they weren't prepared to do the business, but what they wanted to hear about, they didn't want to hear about how many DSOs or VCs were going to be awarded. They wanted to be told what sort of Britain they were going to come back to after the war. And that was something that every diary and letter of the time pays heed to. And Churchill was totally uninterested in what happened after the war. All he cared about was winning the war, and thank God he did take that view. But his understanding of the mood of those men Montgomery understood those men. So, no, I don't think Montgomery deserves to be thought of as one of the great captains of history. But I do think he was a jolly able professional soldier. And so many of British professional soldiers had turned out to be absolute bunglers that I think we were all lucky to have him, actually. And we've got one final question to yeah. the gentleman there. Looking at the war more broadly, in fact, looking at both the First and Second World Wars, two big differences were, first of all, the much wider scope of the wars and secondly the devastating power of modern weaponry if it's possible to make allowance for this uh, do, do you think the second war was any more brutal than previous wars well it's you can say the very simple statistics that i mean nobody no, really knows about the numbers but the broad figures everybody uses they talk about 20 million deaths in the first world war and about 60 in the second and there's a margin of error of about 10 million uh, either way, which historians argue about. So um, the Second World War, that's why one can definitely call it the, the, the greatest experience, the most terrible experience in human history. Um, but it was something, and uh, one thing that's hugely striking, I'm at the moment writing a book on 1914, and of course one is very aware 
They weren't idiots, the statesmen and rulers of 1914. They did idiotic things, but they were clever, highly educated, intelligent men. But they were Victorians. They'd all grown up in the 19th century. They'd grown up a completely different era, before aircraft, before electricity, before telephones, um, uh, before um, these colossally powerful, as you say, new weapons. And they were completely out of their depth. They regarded the idea of going to war with insouciance that to us seems absolutely fantastic, but that's how they were. I think the most important, my parting thought, I do think the only thing I think is most frightfully important for all historians is to try to see things as the people of the time saw them. I, I really, when I really behave like Colonel Blimp and hit the roof is when I'm sent a book preview by some, somebody um, who seems to me to simply want to impose the values of the 21st century on completely different conditions of the 1940s. And it's so childish, it takes us nowhere. Of course we wouldn't have done the same things, but that's not the point. All that matters for a historian, or the kind of history I'm interested in, how did things look to them there as they were? And it's an absolute conceit on the part of some idiot like A.C. Grayling, who wrote one of the worst books on strategic bombing I've ever read, um, uh, you know, who was just saying, well, of course, the whole thing was monstrous. And I don't care what A.C. Grayling uh, thinks about things now. We know that if he'd been Bomber Harris, he wouldn't have done that. But all I'm interested in is what, what they, where they were then. Anyway, thank you all very much indeed. <laughs>